Hi, hello. In this session, I'm going to present an introduction to impact assessment. My name is Angeles Mendoza Samet, and I am a lecturer in environmental planning and management at IEG. So my purpose for this lecture is to explain the basis of impact assessment, the main, main steps, and to help you identify the impacts and benefits of dams and other river barriers for the assignment that you need to complete. But before that, I would like to put you in a situation. So imagine that you live in a small city and there is a very nice river at the edge of your neighborhood and you like going there. In fact, you have been going there since you were a child. That was one of your most favorite places in the whole town. And the river is still in a relatively good condition with uh, birds, fish, um, there are different plants on, on the edges. And then now that you are older, your family really enjoys going there. However, there have been some changes as it happens in the environment. And in the previous year, there was too much rain and then the river flooded and some houses that now had been built closer to the river were flooded. So that creates a political situation. And then some people might decide, well, we need to prevent more flooding. So then let's put um, a small dam on the river. What does this situation represent to you? How could people know what to do? Because of course, some people would like to keep the river as it is. In fact, it's a nice place and maybe it could bring also visitors to this part of the town or to the town. So what we see is a different interest, different priorities that somehow need to be put together on the balance. And that is the role of impact assessment. But first, let's clarify one term that sometimes might be confusing. You might have heard about effects or impacts. Some people think that they are the same. But in impact assessment, we distinguish an effect as just a change that happens because of a project or an intervention like a policy, a law, or a plan. And the effects can be positive or negative. So then to talk about the positive effects, we use the word benefit. And to talk about the negative effects, we usually use the word impact. And in fact, that is how it is known in most countries environmental impact assessment, for example. And that is because from the beginning, people were concerned about those negative effects that human activities had on the environment. So impact assessment started at the end of the 1960s after societies in different parts of the world started to complain about the effects that human activities were having on the environment and how those effects were also affecting people and other species. The first law that included impact assessment was the US National Environmental Policy Act. It specified that all federal actions needed to be evaluated to determine its impacts on the environment. So it didn't specify specifically projects, but any federal actions, and that included the laws, policies, plans, and programs, what we call the strategic actions. We have two terms that are very similar. Impact assessment is the general term that refers to identifying the future consequences of a proposed action. And the impact 
is equivalent to that change that will happen. And we consider the baseline, which is the situation without the proposed action, and then the future with that proposed action. Environmental and social impact assessment refers specifically to evaluating those potential impacts of a project or development, uh, considering the interactions between social, economic, and environmental components. And this can be uh, distinguished even into other categories like cultural, health impacts, um, biophysical impacts, and other more. And it will consider also the impacts and benefits. You might be familiar already with the use of environmental assessment and what is its purpose. Here I'm going to just review that. Since the Rio Declaration of 1992, impact assessment is considered as a tool for sustainable development. But it's not only a tool, it's a process that also tries to improve governance and participation in the decisions about development. One of its purpose is to manage the negative effects or the impacts on biophysical, social, and other components, and to protect the integrity of ecosystems. That means to maintain ecological processes, functions, productivity, and capacity that in turn will benefit society. At the end, it tries to promote development towards sustainability, to support those people that need to make decisions so they know what are the trade-offs among these different components, the social, the environmental, and the economic. Usually, we see sustainability represented as three circles that overlap in a small area, and that area is sustainability. But we change that in impact assessment because we need to recognize and especially know all this discussion about climate change, for example, and catastrophes show how the environment sustains the economy and society. You might be familiar on how impact assessment is practiced in many countries. In many countries, and for example, I am from Mexico, the emphasis has been mainly on determining the environmental impacts. That means how the project affects the environment with not much attention to the social impacts. So how the project will affect society positively or negatively. Uh, in impact assessment, we also try to consider more. So how a project and intervention can contribute to the well-being of society and the environment. That means that, for example, if a population, a sector of the population is going to be affected by a project, for example, a new dam that requires relocating people, the emphasis will not be only on bringing them a house, but should be in giving them conditions so they can be better than they were before. That means not only to restore what they lost, but also to help them develop new capacities. In that um, aspect, impact assessment propose specific mitigations that will help enhance the benefits of a project. So sustainability is more than just those three spheres that usually are considered, and considers also that all are interdependent. There are different modalities of impact assessment. 
the best known is environmental impact assessment that should include social aspects, so not be focused only on the environment. Another modality very common in technology or in product design is life cycle assessment. This considers whether the different impacts and benefits related to a production process or a specific pro product considering its inputs and outputs, for instance, what materials are needed to produce that specific thing, what wastes are generated, and what happens at the end when this product is uh, sold, is used, and then is discharged when it's not uh, useful anymore. That is the life cycle from when it is created up to its end of life or disposal. Another common uh, modality is strategic environmental assessment. Although it is uh, included now in the legislation of many countries, it is still not as practiced as environmental impact assessment that is required for projects. Strategic environmental assessment will look at the impacts and benefits of strategic interventions and also inform people more about the trade-offs among these different impacts and benefits. It's more participatory than environmental impact assessment because, unfortunately, public participation is not develop to the same degree in different countries. So the law determines the requirements for public participation in impact assessment, especially environmental impact assessment. But for a strategic environmental assessment, the involvement of stakeholders is required. And is required also because it's a longer process and it aims to inform policy. Because of that, it needs to consider the different views of stakeholders. Also because it's a long-term process for a long-term outcome. The steps of the impact assessment process are the same across the world. Of course, they might be called slightly differently, but they represent or should include the same activities. The first one is the screening, and that is to determine if an impact assessment is needed. And that is based usually on the existing legislation in a country. The next step is the scoping. In this step, it is the determined what would be the content of the assessment? That includes concerns from stakeholders, from authority, specific aspects included in the regulation, and also the boundaries. For example, what would be the geographical boundaries that need to be included in the assessment? What are the temporal boundaries that need to be considered? That is, how far in the future should the impacts be analyzed, and sometimes also what activities that occur in the past could also interact with the project or activity that is proposed. It's important in this scoping also to identify the stakeholders that need to be included in the process. The next activity is to identify alternatives. And this is to explore other ways in which the same purpose should be achieved. A project or intervention has a specific purpose and it could be met in different ways. For example, if we're talking about energy, there are different options. One could be hydropower, other wind power, solar, a combination of different technologies, and these alternatives could be compared. Alternatives also can be, for example, different locations 
or we're talking about a dam, for example, and different heights of the quartile. So location, size are alternatives for the project. The next step is the analysis of impacts. In scoping, there is a preliminary identification of impacts, but once uh, one is doing the research or consulting people, other impacts might come. So in the impact analysis, uh, there could be different methods used, different expertise need to be combined here to integrate the impacts on different components of the environment. And in biodiversity, hydrology, geology, economy, society, human health. There are multiple aspects and those depends on the depend on the particular project. So impact analysis is the use of these different disciplines first independently, but then need to be uh, combined to really understand how a project and the different activities of the project might interact to create different types of impacts or benefits. Once these impacts are identified, then the next step is to determine the significance of those impacts or benefits. Attention is given to those that are more significant because those are the ones that need to be mitigated. And the mitigations are different measures to try to reduce the negative impacts. The next step is the reporting. So all what has been done during the analysis and in fact from the screening up to the management of mitigations need to be included in a report that could be submitted to the authorities. And this is the part when the team that is creating the assessment will submit the findings to the parties that are interested. Could be the communities, the authorities, the same proponent of the project, donors, and so it should be a public document. And this document need to communicate in a clear way what are the impacts and benefits of the project and for communities or stakeholders, how different stakeholders could be affected or benefit, benefited and what measures had been proposed to reduce the negative effects. Once the report is complete, it could be submitted for reviewing. Depending on the regulation in a country, this might be done just by the authorities or might involve experts, which will look at these different aspects that were analyzed. And in some countries, also the public might participate in the revision. After the report is reviewed, then the authorities will issue a decision. However, this process is not linear, it's interactive. And that means that usually up to the moment of decision, it's possible to identify flaws in the assessment or areas that should be added because situations have changed. And then one needs to start back sometimes even to analyze other alternatives or to include other impacts on the analysis. Once the authorities are satisfied with the content of the assessment, uh, if they decide to approve the project, the last step is the implementation and follow up. This is a crucial step. Unfortunately, is also the weak step because especially in developing countries, there, the agencies, the environmental agencies don't have enough staff or resources to do good inspections to ensure that the proponents 
are implementing those mitigations that were identified during the assessment process. So this is unfortunate, but uh, it's important during the assessment process to try to do a thorough assessment to propose the mitigations. And important for the implementation is to assign clear roles and responsibilities. At the end, whoever is responsible for the project is the proponent. And the proponent is also responsible for the implementation of the mitigations, but other parties have a role. For example, the contractors of the project also need to know the mitigations because they need to implement them during the construction phase. The authorities have a specific role, which is the inspection and verification, but also the public can be participating in this part if they are informed of what the mitigations are. So that is why public participation is very important in the impact assessment process. Uh, is required in most countries. Of course, it's done to different degrees, but it has different purposes. And in the previous diagram, you have noticed a star, and that star indicates the steps in which public participation is commonly used. During the assessment process, the knowledge that communities have about their environment is very useful and can save time and money to the proponent because they know the area and their knowledge can complement the scientific knowledge also can make the impacts and the analysis more accurate. Also, the local communities need to accept the project, especially if they could be affected in some way by it. And that acceptance is called the social license to operate. So it's important that the communities understand the project, what it is about, and what are the impacts and benefits. There are some cases in which projects might affect the rights of people. In that case, and this could result in other uh, processes that might delay or stop the, uh, the assessment process or the project. And there are different uh, Pro projects that have been cancelled because of concerns from the public or opposition. If there are clear violations of rights, and citizens and other groups might even sue the proponent or the government because of these violations. All this results in more costs for whoever is going to and fund the project. So it's important to involve the public early in the process to understand what are the concerns of the public and integrate those concerns in the impact assessment. Just to illustrate the boundaries, we are talking about different areas that might be affected by the project. And that is also important to consider for public participation, because we have in the circle at the center, the area that is directly affected by the project, where it is going to be located. That is the project footprint. And then we have a direct zone of influence in which the direct impacts of the project would be experienced. But we have also an indirect zone of influence in which changes also related to the project might happen. If we are talking, for example, about building a dam, the project footprint could be that area where the dam will be built. The direct zone of influence 
might be that area that is also affected by the construction work. The indirect zone of influence might be a surrounding area that is affected because of the traffic of trucks with materials or employees or the settlement of workers that are arriving to the area. If the dam or the river that will be modified crosses the boundary of a municipality, a state, or province, even a country, then we can have transboundary impacts. But also, uh, I have talked about different components of the environment. These components themselves might require different boundaries. If we are talking, for example, about wildlife, we have different species that inhabit a particular area. But those species have different habitat requirements, different ranges. So we need to consider all these different ranges and integrate them to have the area uh, of potential impacts on wildlife species. And as I mentioned before, we also have temporal boundaries, which usually uh, might be not only the short term when the project is going to be built, but go up to the long term at the end of the expected life of the project. And that might determine the, say, the number of years that need to be included on the assessment and if it is too far in the future, for example, a dam that is expected to be operational for 100 years, it is not possible to predict impacts that long, but then other tools are used, for example, the analysis of the scenarios. So the analysis of impacts is usually divided in three different phases of the project, which is the construction, well, that we can consider a short term, the operation that might be medium to long term, and the decommission or end of life, which will be long term. So I have mentioned different types of impacts, and I will leave this table for you to later read and with more time. I will briefly describe them. So those direct impacts, also sometimes called primary impacts, result from the direct interaction of an activity or work of the project with the environment. The indirect impacts result when that change in the environment that is caused by the activity also affects other components of the environment. Imagine, for example, a soccer ball that you kick and then hits a pole and then changes direction and hits something different. So that would be an indirect impact. If we talk, for example, um, a dam for which uh, vegetation needs to be cut, that cutting of vegetation could be the direct impact. The indirect impact would be the loss of habitat for the species that uh, use that particular type of vegetation. Induced impacts can be also considered indirect, but there is a difference. The induced impacts occur later on time. It is not uh, say more on the short time as could be the indirect impacts. If we are talking about the loss of habitat for a particular species because vegetation was cut, an induced effect could occur later on time. And that could be experienced, for example, as the decline on the population of that particular species after at some time, some years. Cumulative effects are also very important, although not all 
legislation talks about these effects. But cumulative effects are those that, at the end, result more in the degradation of the environment. The Council for Environmental Quality of the U.S. defined cumulative effects several years ago in a special report as those impacts that result from the successive incremental, synergistic, or combined effects of one action when it adds to the impacts of other existing plant or future uh, foreseen activities. And so it sounds a little complex, but basically what we have is that we have a project and this project will be placed in a particular environment where there are other things happening also or other things that are already planned to happen. The potential impacts that this project might have might interact with impacts of these other activities to make them larger and what we could call more significant. Uh, imagine that you live in a small city and there is not much traffic. And then somebody builds a factory, a big factory, and lots of people move to your small city. We have previous traffic, but now with the new factory and people arriving, there is more traffic. So this is an incremental effect. We can think about, for example, the pollution. If we have a factory that is discharging wastewater to a lake, for example, maybe it is when the capacity of the lake to process um, or to um, clean the water. But if we have other factories or we have a city that is also discharging uh, wastewater into the lake, we will exceed the capacity of this lake to process all those contaminants and nutrients that are added. Also, cumulative effects result from the uh, accumulation of impacts that by themselves are considered non-significant, but when we put them together, they become a large one. That is called like the death for a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. I will uh, illustrate that later, but uh, an example is imagine that you are cutting uh, one tree of one forest. If you cut a single tree, it might not have an effect at all because there are many other trees. But then other people come and cut another tree. Maybe still the impact is not even noticeable. But other people come and start also to cut trees. So, so cutting a single tree is not a significant impact, but when you have lots of people going and cutting trees, each one of them, at the end, there would be no more forest. So uh, that is an example. And the, the last impact or type of impact that I want to mention is the transboundary. I already illustrated that with the boundaries, but we all experience many transboundary effects. And one of them, the one we hear a lot about in this time is climate change. No? Because emissions are originated in a particular location, might be a country, but then they go into the atmosphere and cross national boundaries. So air pollution moves even, it has shown now, even across continents. North America receives pollution and those from China 
so that is a stream of transboundary effects. And the most common ones are, for example, when we have a dam built in a river that they share across countries, and then the dam reduces the amount of water that goes into the country downstream. Impact assessment is an interdisciplinary process. I mentioned before that involves the expertise of um, different disciplines, and also because of that, it involves different methods. This is just a list of methods that are commonly used in impact assessment, but every type of method can be used. The methods that are required depend on the type of project. For instance, if we have a, a dam, of course, we need to involve hydrologists. If we have a dam that is going to affect habitat of species, which most dams do, we need to include, for instance, a fish specialist, um, aquatic biologist, um, vegetation specialist, botanist, whatever expertise is needed. That depends on the types of impacts that are expected. And usually the methods will be of different nature. We can use qualitative models like um, hydrological models, art dispersion models. We can use expert uh, systems or so computational models that simulate processes, for example, how um, pollutants move from one area to another. We can also have uh, qualitative methods that are more based on asking experts for their opinion, especially for areas where there is not much information about um, human populations or about particular species. So the array is uh, really diverse. Uh, I think you might be familiar with most of these terms, maybe not with the first one, which is analogs. And that is basically, uh, sometimes there is no information in a locality where a project is going to be built, but maybe there is information from a similar project in another locality, another impact assessment report. A team might look at that other impact assessment report to get information and is to be familiar with the type of impacts that could be expected. Not to copy the information because that could not be correct, but just to have an idea of the type of impasse that should be included in the assessment and then with participation of the stakeholders explore more the impasse that might happen in the particular location where the project would be located. So here we don't have time to explore the methods but you already come from different disciplines. All what you have learned in your previous studies, studies sorry, uh, reflects uh, knowledge that you can use. You might have already uh, learned how to use different models or how to conduct surveys, how to set a questionnaire or interview people. All those are methods that can be used in impact assessment. So you can reflect on all what you already know and think how oh, that that I learned in my work or in my career could be used for impact assessment. During your studies here at IHE, you will learn also more methods and tools. Uh, you will learn about GIS, GIS. also will learn about uh, methods like network analysis or environmental cost and benefit, um, 
a literate review, mass balances. So all these methods that tell you about the current state of a particular system or part of a system can be used to infer how that system could change if a project or intervention is going to affect it. Matrices are the most common method used in impact assessment because they are used to synthesize the information from different disciplines. And the basic matrix used in impact assessment is called the Lopold matrix that shows the impacts that are expected and then the elements of the environment that could receive those impacts. And this matrix in each one of the cells represents with numbers or with figures the magnitude of the effect that is expected and the importance. In this case, it's this importance for society. And then based on this information, the different impacts uh, will be described. This information will uh, be used in the other, the next step of the impact assessment, which is to determine the significance of the impacts that are identified. Impacts are described based on specific characteristics. So what is the direction they represent? It's basically, are they positive or negative? or there is no impact on a specific component. By the way, here you see the word BEC, VEC, that means valued ecosystem component. So is that part of the environment that would be affected by the project? Other characteristic of one impact is the scope of or geographical extent. That is, uh, what is the area that is affected by this particular impact. Could be from very localized to regional or even international. The duration, for how long will the impact be experienced? Is it only for a short term or could be a long term of permanent change on the environment from which the system could not recover? The frequency, how often will this impact be experienced? Is something that occurs only once or will occur, for example, every day? If we're talking about, for instance, traffic of vehicles during the construction of a project, that might be occurring every day. Maybe not during the weekends, but it could be daily. And others might be sporadic. For example, if we are talking about a dam and there needs to be some blasting to break the rock, maybe it would be sporadic. Then the magnitude. This magnitude should not be uh, confused with uh, the scope or extent. The magnitude refers to the degree in which uh, the processes or functions are affected. We are talking about ecological processes or functions or biological um, processes or even social processes. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, here we have uh, the reproductive capacity of a species or changes in the suitability of habitat for a specific species. Mm -hmm. If uh, we are going to have uh, works that disturb vegetation and then disturb, for example, birds that are nesting, uh, the magnitude might be not important if the impact will happen in a season where there are few birds and maybe the birds are not nesting because the reproduction will not be affected. But birds are very sensitive to noise and disturbance, so if the impact occurs during the breeding season, then the impact or the magnitude 
of this particular impact might be really high because uh, the birds might even abandon the nests and leave uh, the offspring there. So these characteristics of impacts are integrated to determine what is the significance of the particular impact. It is shown in this table. This is only one example of the different ways in which these characteristics can be combined. Now, but what is important is that we need to determine the significance of the effects based on multiple criteria, not only one. Now, in this case, uh, there is a combination of the duration and magnitude of the impact together with the extent that is affected. So what happens then? So we have done the scoping, we have also conducted the analysis, we determine the significance of the impacts, and then what it's next is to develop mitigations. Because remember that the role of impact assessment is also to try to avoid or minimize the impacts of development. So mitigations are measures aimed to preferably avoid the impact from happening. If that is not possible, then to reduce its um, magnitude or geographical scope. If that is not possible, then there needs to be a restoration or if not, maybe compensation. It's important that the mitigations should not create additional impacts. No, that means a mitigation should try to um, avoid or minimize impacts, but not create new ones. And these are just a few examples. For example, if we are going to have a dam built in a location, some impacts might be avoided if the dam is located in other part, especially if, for example, there is a sensitive habitat for some species, probably the dam could be located in other tributary of the basin. Uh, to reduce, for instance, we could uh, estimate what is the optimal size for the reservoir, considering uh, the flow of water, uh, the climate, but also considering the perspectives for changes in precipitation due to climate change. Uh, many many dams sometimes have been overestimated and uh, that means that they are very high and most of the time they will be almost empty. Offset uh, is uh, one type of compensation and here I will distinguish between these two terms. Compensate is to uh, give something in retribution and to those that would be affected by the project. Uh, in the past, it was common, for example, if people could be relocated to give them money because of the loss of property. That is not considered a good practice anymore because people usually ended poorer than before. So they could spend the money and then don't even have a place to live. So no, there are specific uh, policies that guide how uh, relocation and compensation should be given to people that are affected by a project. Offsetting refers to compensating, but in other areas far from where the project is. For example, if we have a 
dam and there will be loss of wetlands, different regulations that protect wetlands require the restoration of wetlands or even the construction of new wetlands in other areas to compensate for the loss where uh, it is possible, not in the area where the project is going to be built. But also the mitigations consider the possibility to increase the benefits of the project. So it's not only about the negative, it's also about the positive. Uh, for example, if it is decided that a dam is really needed to supply water, maybe the dam could be also used for other purposes to benefit the population. Some dams are created for multiple purposes, like recreation or also to have more fish that people could uh, eat or fish or be used to attract tourism to the area. So the mitigations are about trying to minimize the impacts and, if possible, increase the benefits of the project. I will mention here, but not really in this presentation, that at the end, these mitigations should be included in what is called an environmental and social management plan. And this will specify what are the impacts, the mitigations for each impact, and then who is responsible for the implementation of those mitigations. So this is a brief introduction to impact assessment, and then we need to talk about your assignment. So what are you going to do? Uh, you have already watched uh, two short videos, created one for the International Association for Impact Assessment about what is impact assessment, and the other explaining the scoping uh, created by the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, you have uh, the Rhine Basin as the case study for this module, and you also, for the DIPSER analysis, already watched a video about the situation of fish in this basin. And the Rhine and its tributaries have been transformed over centuries, creating different barriers that now have resulted in a decline on biodiversity, especially aquatic biodiversity. And one of the options that had already been implemented in different parts of the basin, but also in Europe, is to try to remove barriers for fish migration to restore the population. So for the case of impact assessment, you have there information about the removal of a weir in the Lipper River in Germany. This is one of the tributaries of the Rhine. What you have to do is to get information about the impacts of different obstructions on rivers, but also about the benefits of why people build this infrastructure in the first place, what they try to get, what they try to avoid, and later, so why they see the need to remove them. So try to look at these different types of impacts and then you are going to integrate these impacts in a table. So in this table, you will compare two situations, one building a weird and the other removing a weird. And for the removal of the weird, you will read uh, the information on the removal of this infrastructure in the Lipper River, and then you also have some information about 
some of the changes that have happened after the removal. So you will create a table and based on the information that you gather, consider three of the impacts that you think are more significant for the construction of a weir, or if you think there could be a significant impact from the removal, you can also include it. So for these three impacts, try to think on a potential mitigation. And then you already have also uh, review information about the deep sear model. You already also have started probably to, to work on identifying different drivers, pressures, states, impacts, and responses. So these are two different tools, let's call it that way, uh, to analyze a process uh, and also how a specific um, situation results from the interaction of different components. In deep sear, you have different driving forces that are pressures that change the state of the environment, resulting in some impacts that require a response. So how does that relate to what we have reviewed as the steps of the impact assessment process. Do you see any relationships, any similarities? Remember, in the impact assessment process, we need to identify uh, actions, uh, also identify how those actions are going to affect the environment, what impacts will be generated, and we need to do something about those impacts, propose mitigations. So how do these different tools relate? That is what you need to discuss. So this will be a short report. And for this, you need to include a list of references. Just to illustrate what you have to do, I have here two examples of tables. So one is uh, for the impacts and benefits of uh, building a dam or beer and removing it. So list them and then for the discussion, compare those two situations based on the impacts and benefits. Then you will uh, select three of the impacts and propose mitigations for them. So if you don't find information, just use your common sense how it would be possible to mitigate an impact. For example, a common one is obstruction of fish movement, how it is usually mitigated. Uh, you can find initially information on the literature, but also you have an article there on the readings that talks about the impacts and benefits of um, dams. So with this, I conclude the presentation and just as extra information, look for the extra slides in this presentation. Uh, these extra slides include examples of impacts and benefits of dams um, from different sources of the literature. And also there is one slide that talk about mitigations of some of the structures associated to dams. With that, I wish you a good day and I hope to see you later on uh, Thursday to discuss any questions that you might have about the assignment or the materials for this topic of impact assessment. And also, I look forward to see you in person later. So, have a good day.